Okay, so what, what we've been hearing is um, uh, some information about new and emerging knowledge and also technologies that are sort of coming about. Our world is changing, um, illustrating with a number of projects, hospital and, and schools, um, to look at how these sort of new knowledge and, and technology considerations need to be taken into account when we do daylight design for these space. So I'd just like to open to the floor now. Um, anybody have a sort of urgent question? Put, put hands up. The mic will come your way. If you can um, just uh, briefly state your name and uh, where you're from, that'd be great. Hello. Uh, oh, God, that's loud. Um, John Modalievich, uh, Loughborough. A question for the last presenter. Um, nothing wrong necessarily with using the daylight factor. However, I would encourage looking at the median value rather than the average because the, the median value in those spaces was probably about one or two. And that's so you know that half the people in the classroom are actually getting less than one or two percent. And it'll also be a better diagnostic to differentiate between multi-aspect and, and single aspect. And I won't mention climate-based modeling at all. <laughs> yes, you can comment. Of course, this is... Um, it's a 10-minute presentation, and it's a bit it's a, to provoke, <laughs> actually, because this is uh, not the only way of looking at it. We have been uh, doing, it, uh, doing it and in different ways, uh, but it's uh, nice to get your comments. Uh, the thing is that, in, in my opin opinion, looking at the average daylight factor doesn't say anything about the quality of uh, the light in the space, so you have to look at it in, in different ways. Um, yeah. Um, any other questions from the floor? Yeah, good afternoon. Renate Hammer from Austria. I would have a question to uh, uh, Mr. Wolf. Um, you, you're facing your, um, or you suggest the, the facing of your rooms f um, to the east, more or less. And uh, the question for me was, do you mean that there, there is the possibility of, of producing vitamin D behind uh, a, a glass uh, glassed window facing to the east? Did, it, did, did you have any measurements about the, the input of, of the relevant radiation? Uh, we're talking two, two things. Vitamin D is not, uh, I mean, specific east. But there is uh, more UVB from the sun and the sky south than there is only from the sky north. So you have like a graduation when you were talking UV. But, but, but east is not, uh, east has less UVB than south. So east is more for the circadian rhythm to, to yeah. Yeah, I'm Kelt Jonsson from the Danish Building Research. First, a short comment to John Medaljevic. Uh, of course, you're right about uh, the mean and average, but any skilled architect would see that there would be plenty of daylight in this room, so you don't need all these uh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> climate-based daylight analysis. Stina made, a very, Stina made a very uh, fine presentation. Uh, and was one of the few of the speakers we have heard today who stressed the fact that we need large windows, but we also need some sun sh uh, solar shading devices. That's very important, and I'm very surprised, a little bit disappointed about today. Most of the speakers talk about the facades as they are static all the time, mm. and, and just talk about the window sizes, and don't talk about uh, solar shading devices. Paul Littlefair mentioned it uh, shortly, but, but I'm very surprised that so few people talk about dynamic facades. Why don't we make the facades so they adapt to, the, to any changing needs over the day and over the year? I'm very surprised that we see, still, still see these overglassed buildings and poor sun, uh, solar shading devices. So let's, let's work more with dynamic facades which can adapt to the uh, 
changing needs of the users and the climates. Yeah, I think that's certainly is an important uh, new knowledge that we'll need rather than just about daylight and human performance direct link, but it's also the responsive side of how they behave and in turn is what does it mean in our mm. design. Um, any other questions? From the floor? Um, I actually would like to ask one to Deborah. Um, so what's the next step? I mean, it's really quite serious about lighting designers trying to administer this kind of drugs to people, um, if we sort of look at it in that way. And, and a lot of discussion has been going on in terms of design for health and well-being, circadian lighting, etc. So what, what do you think is the next step that we should do? Well, the next step is, is really interesting. As I mentioned earlier, in terms of treading in each other's sandbox, we not only have to go outside our comfort zone, mm. we have to become comfortable in another sandbox. We have to learn how to speak medical and scientific and present our research for publication mm. in scientific peer review journals, not just limit it to design or architectural journals. We need to step out of our comfort zone. We also need to be able to embrace the fact that we do not practice in a silo. We need to have design mm -hmm. practitioners in as participants as well as key research um, professionals on every scientific and medical project and research project that has anything to do with ambient light. We can provide a, a very specific type of input that scientific and medical researchers are just not trained to mm. be able to perceive. From our end of it, we need to be able to go outside our boundaries and take upon ourselves the challenge of education insist that those that we bring into our office as interns, insist any time that we see a educational professional to ask them, what is it that you're teaching in terms of health and light? How far do you get into the medicine, the biology, the, mm. um, the chronobiology and specifics of pharmacology even? How far do you pass other areas? And then take it upon ourselves to when we have a project, no longer just ask, what's your budget, what's your aesthetic means, and what are you expecting from energy efficiency? And then when the preliminary budget comes in, you step back and you offer VE, value engineering. We need to be able to offer more mm. from the front end. We need to be on the front end of the project with the architectural team and the stakeholders to be able to determine and prioritize wellness and give stakeholders an idea of what they're literally looking at and also start taking surveys, pre and post hoc surveys so that we can document our work and start acting like professionals that we are mm. instead of design professionals. Because in the future, the lines are blurred. We're not gonna be design professionals. We're gonna be more, if we continue on the road of circadian science, more like quasi-medical professionals that have to work with a team of scientists mm. and medical practitioners. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah.